Hello, you wonderful people, and welcome to another episode of Super Fantify. This being a show where I talk about TV shows of the supernatural, fantasy, and or science fictional genre. For today's episode, I'm going to talk about the series premiere of Frequency. So before I get started, um, I do know that, I mean, obviously I saw it at the beginning, but I kind of like had a, I, I never bothered looking it up because I should have, because I was curious about it. But I know that this TV show is based on a movie now. Because um, I recently, a little while back, came across uh, the movie. I was flipping through channels and I was reading. I saw a movie called Frequency. I was like, oh, that's kind of interesting. There's a TV show coming out called Frequency. And then I ended up reading the description of the movie. I was like, that's okay. Talking to someone's dead. I was like, that seems very similar to this um, TV show's plot. And I was thinking, like, oh, so is the TV show an adaptation of the movie? And it's like, yeah, it is. Because uh, I know the movie's like from like 1994. I think it had uh, Jim Caviezel in it, which I get super excited about. Because it's like, ah. Uh, uh, because I just, you know, I just automatically think of, um, anytime I hear his name or think about him, it's like I automatically think of him as, um, Reese from Person of Interest, so. But, uh, a very interesting, uh, show, uh, kind of another time travel show. I just think that's so interesting, like, so much time travel stuff. Twelve Monkeys, Legends of Tomorrows, I'm currently doing, uh, Timeless, The Flash has come back, and that's heavily pushing on the whole time travel stuff. You know, that's not heavy, I mean, it plays a part in, like, all the seasons of, um, The Flash so far, so that's, I know, it's just kind of an interesting thing, just all this, like, time travel stuff. So, I just think it's kind of an interesting time that I'm doing this. But nonetheless... A very, inter a very, very interesting show. Uh, we have Raimi uh, being a detective who basically lost her dad when she was eight years old, which I found that very interesting that she ended up being a cop. Because I, from the previews, I don't, I don't think it ever really showed her being a cop. Like I didn't even know her dad was a cop. Like, like I said, I vaguely remember from like the little bit I read of the description of the movie that it was like, oh, connected to a cop or whatever. But it was like I, I just didn't put two and two together. Like I said, I skimmed it a little bit, like a while back. So, um, but the fact is, her dad was a cop, particularly an undercover cop. And basically, when he died, a lot of people were saying like he was a dirty cop and whatnot. And but finding that out, because like, like as the episode progresses, it's like, oh, she's like, uh, Detective Solomon. I was like, wait, you're a cop? It's like you talk. You, it's like okay, you had. It seems like you hold such a grudge against your dad. Well, I mean, eventually it was kind of like you, it seems like she has such a grudge against her dad. It's like it's very interesting that you would become a cop, but I guess maybe. It was kind of to spite him in a sort of sense. Well, maybe it's a combination of like, hey, finding out the people who killed her dad, but also combining with the fact this is a way of spiting him. It's like, oh, he was a dirty cop. I'm going to be the best cop there is, you know. Kind of like, because I mean, it's just the first episode and it hasn't come up, but I'm curious is that something she had to deal with the fact this because her dad was a quote unquote dirty cop? Did she kind of have to struggle with that? We never really had that brought up this episode or not. So, but the whole like uh, premise of just like, talking to her dad through that radio was just kind of an interesting concept to me. It was just a form of time travel through communication, not physically time traveling. Uh, but I liked how the effects worked and everything, just the conversations between them. is just like slowly piecing it together. Like, wait, your name's Frank? Well, my name's Ramey. It's like, um... My dad, you know, like, you know, he didn't want to believe it. She didn't want to believe it. I even like how it's represented on, like, how time affects things as, like, he burnt the cigar on the radio box and it, it started burning in the present day, too. So, like, you know, it, there's an instant reaction of, like, the moment something happens, it instantly, like... Because, you know, certain things, I know I'll keep bringing it back and forth. Because it's kind of a similar case of, like, 12 Monkeys. Because, I mean, obviously, both of them being um, originally movies that were adapted into uh, TV shows... Um, it does make me wonder, will I ever, because I'm still, I still have not watched 12 Monkeys, even though I keep saying I should do that, just to kind of compare it. Um, I'm pretty sure, like, the parts of the first season are very close to the movie. I'm sure in both these cases, obviously, I mean, we're still not even, we've only, like, taken the first step in this season, so. But, um, I, I am curious to see, maybe it'll be something I do afterwards, just kind of see, like, okay, where... The movie picked up where it ended, like what its resolution was compared to like, okay, you know, maybe the TV show is taking that concept and instead of giving it a close, it's like, oh, but what if we took it a step further and left this kind of like, oh, these certain developments happen to kind of expand upon the story, kind of flush out the world and events a little bit more. But um, 
I know, because like, like my, the point I was making, I'm sorry, I kind of trailed off there, is the fact is at 12 Monkeys, it takes time a little while to kind of uh, fix itself to, to to adjust to the current events, but it seems like stuff happens instantaneously in a show like them, especially when he put the flag into the, when he uh, scorched the flag into the radio, uh, it, it instantly happened in her t- in 2016, which I love that. That was kind of a cute symbol of basically being like, hey, like, this is my signal to my little girl that uh, there's something here for you. So that was kind of nice. But, um, like I said, in the conversations, like, because it was kind of interesting, like, she had the chance to talk to her dad a little bit. They're having jokes and everything. But then she tells him the fact that she's going to die. And he's, like, flipping out. He's like, oh, what's going on? Give me more details. How can you know the things? It's like, well, we've kind of had some advancements in, like, the 20 years you've been dead. Um, I even like the interesting aspect of the fact is that she's older than he actually is right now. Because uh, she's currently 28 in 2016. And she's actually older than him, you know. Which is actually kind of sad to actually think about the fact is that you're older than one of your, like, one of your parents, you know. You're older than one of your parents that died. That's kind of a shame to actually think about. But, um, it was a conversation that started off very fun-loving and everything. And then it got serious with the whole aspect of, like, oh, I died. And then it turned even more serious when she was like, you know what? I hope things work out for you. He's like, oh, I'm trying to understand all this. She's like, you were a dirty cop. He's like, I wasn't a dirty cop. People, I, I can't believe, you know. Just it meet like it was one of those things. I guess it was one of those things she kind of held resentment against. I mean, because because of his job, he left her family behind, uh, broke up with her mom, and they kind of went their separate ways. It did seem like he was struggling to. The whole point he was going to do is try to get away from this undercover case. He'd been undercover for like two years. It was interfering with things. So I guess he felt the need to kind of distance himself from his wife and child just so he could make sure they were safe, so they wouldn't kind of get any backlash from what they were doing. Like. It makes you wonder, did his wife really understand what was going on, that he was an undercover cop? Um, I mean, it seems like Raimi probably did to a certain degree, but she was still like, because there was no records of him going undercover, there not being any undercover uh, operation, she just probably simply thought it was like, my dad's a, a dirty cop. But it ends up turning out very, like, nice twisted. The fact is that it was all a setup, like, the whole, like, oh, him going undercover, like, it makes you wonder how much of that was, like... Oh, fluff, because we ended up finding out the people he's working with ended up, they're working with the guy they're trying to take down. I think they called him Little J. Trying to take that dude down, but basically he's got cops on his payrolls that involves the cop that kind of acted as um, Frank's handler. Um, Some other people that were supposed to be there with him. It's just one of those situations. It's kind of a shame that things kind of like went that way because Frank was simply trying to do this case, get it done so he could go back to his wife and child. Um... Something I, I I can't I didn't catch his name, but Mackay Pfeiffer's character. Uh, it seemed like he was a initial and not necessarily Frank's partner back in the day. He's he's um Raimi's lieutenant now, but at least like he was familiar with Frank, you know, close enough to the family to the point that like he looks at Raimi probably he's like you know telling her is like your dad would be proud of the job you have, the, the job that you're doing. So. Literally in the back of my mind, I was thinking like, okay, he seems suspicious. The fact of the matter is he was talking about the fact that it's like, oh yeah, your dad never told me about any operation. I was like, wait a minute, you were having that whole talk about, but then, you know, I talk about the whole like, oh, like he's going to um, try and put things aside and he's going to go back to his family. Which, but at the same time, I was like, I, but then I quickly argued with myself. It's like, well, he never outright said he was doing some operation. He actually kept it hush hush on what he was actually doing, but you know, the, the fact is that Mackay Pfeiffer never mentioned the fact is that Frank was trying to, he's like, he didn't bring up the fact that it's like, your dad did tell me that he was trying to change some things so that he could come back to you and your mom. That conversation never come up, came up, so that's why I'm a little suspicious of him. I mean, like I said, just because I've been watching too much TV lately with uh, suspicious cops and everything. I literally was just talking about Arrow with its corrupt cops. So it's just kind of interesting. That's just, I guess that's why it just, um, I'm very suspicious of everyone. Just like, I'm waiting for the twist and slash turn to show. It's like, oh yeah, you actually were dirty the entire time. So we've never seen everyone involved. We only met that one guy in this episode that she confronted about the kind of cover up with her dad. Um, but I mean, lucky for her, everything kind of worked out in that regard. Well, I'm, I'm cool. I, like before I get to that, I want to bring up her possible fiance because she ended up finding her on ring, Daniel. 
he was talking to her, like, there was a whole point of, like, him, like, oh, like, you know, you're in grief, you know, you're trying to handle this whole situation, so he's, he's like, she's like, she realizes what she was saying was crazy about the fact that she was talking to her dad and everything, and it seemed like he was trying to help, be helpful by throwing out theories and stuff like that, but she was like, no, it's okay, you just kind of like, you know, he's like, no, it's okay, I believe, you know, people want to believe what they want to believe, it's like, you're not the first one to kind of experience, like, this wanting to talk to someone that you miss, and then he hugged her, and he had a look on his face, almost like, he didn't know whether to really believe her or not. Like he he knew that she believed it, whether he believed her or not. He wanted to be supportive without going like, yo, Raimi, you're crazy, babe. I love you, but you're crazy type of thing. So But I mean, like I said, luckily for her, uh her um dad ended up uh getting around the situation because he prepared himself knowing ahead of time and I was just like I got super excited because it's like oh man we're changing time like I said I like time travel is one of those things that I truly adore it's one of those it's probably my favorite aspect of like science fiction is time travel I just think it's just the coolest thing to me uh hands down one of the many reasons why Hiro Nakamura from the tv show Heroes is probably my favorite part of that show he's like my favorite hero like granted I love uh Peter's power just being able to like absorb uh, basically being a power sponge but probably like, you know, solo power, like, Peter's got the better power because he can literally get everyone's powers, but in Hero's case, it just adds just their raw power, just having an ability that's not, oh, basically, I take other people's abilities. I think he had the best ability. I mean, plus his wasn't just time travel, it was teleportation, too. I know I'm getting way off the book here, but the point I was trying to, the thing is, like, like I said, just time travel, awesome. That's all I got to say about that. And... You know, the fact is that he was able to prepare ahead of time, so he's like, oh, this is the, what happens, at least to me dying. He turned around, shot at the truck, ended up surviving. And I like how it's represented, it, like, his life uh, connected to the radio, because it's like, the radio went dim when it seemed like he was going to die. And then when he kind of, like, kind of goes, like, <gasps> breathing, it, like, after being shot, it just kind of lit back up, kind of representing the fact that he's still alive. So that's kind of a key sign of, like, hey, like, there's still life beating in your dad. And it ends up in doing like the changes are immediately immediate, and it kind of, um, kind of coinciding with Flash. She kind of has a situation of like, hey, I've got old memories and new memories. Like of the, I've got memories of when Dad was murdered, and I got the memories of him not being murdered. And it's it was a very beautiful thing. Got a little flash forward of just like all the things that happened of like him being there when she was growing up, being there when she became a cop and everything, which does add an interesting perspective. It's like he knows he was betrayed possibly by his team because he ended up finding out it was a setup and everything. So it's going to be interesting to see like knowing what he knew. Like, how did he go forward with everything? Because, you know, time being the way it is, he knows that Raimi from the future contacted him to save his life. So he lived the rest of his life knowing that knowledge. So that was kind of interesting. It makes you wonder, like, have those future events been affected by Raimi yet? So the memory she has in her head of him congratulating her and become a cop. Uh, did she have a, like did uh, Raimi from 2016 have any point any co other like were those memories based on like events that have also been changed because Raimi had conversations with them or not like maybe the way time is working like uh, however you want to describe it um, maybe she hasn't talked to him yet for those events to even change maybe we'll see as the series uh series goes on that those events even in her memories are changing but it's like she remembers it both ways before and like the original reality and like the past reality like i said uh like comparing it to flash we did see that there was a downside to that because eventually he started losing his memories of the original timeline so it makes me wonder will that be the case or will she throughout the entire season keep that will uh, there will be a backlash for that i'm wondering like I said, it's just a very interesting time that this show ends up coming out. Like I said, at the same time that's happening on The Flash and everything. It's just like I said, just so much time travel going on. I don't mind because each show's got their own perspective on time travel and how they do things. It's like, because this show isn't necessarily a time travel show like Timeless or The Flash or 12 Monkeys because it's not her actually traveling through time. It's her communicating through a device that acts as a means of time travel. So it's just, it's a very interesting perspective on time travel. I'm sure it's probably come up before most likely in the original movie, but um, this is kind of my first experience with this sort of time travel. So I just, I just think it's fascinating. But I also love that we immediately get ramifications because she saved her dad. It led to her... 
mom ended up being one of the victims of like the serial killer known as the Nightingale serial killer because basically he killed nurses for whatever particular reason. I'm sure that's uh, some kind of profiling thing where it's like, oh yeah, like he got screwed over by nuns or something, had a very uh, harsh uh, religious upbringing or something like that and taking it out on nurses, people who heal and it's like, oh, he's healing them in some sick to way. I don't know. Like, we'll have to wait to see. But initially through the timeline, it was some other nurse that died. She was some lady that worked with Raimi's mom. But basically because Raimi and her mom were there at the hospital to look after Frank because he actually lived, it ended with them leaving there, being in the wrong place at the wrong time. And her mom offered to take something from the lady who, in the original timeline, she was the one that was murdered by the Nightingale killer. And now we have her mom being killed. Um, so now she's got to work with her dad to try and, like, I'm guessing that's going to be the main story of trying to change things. Because also we ended up finding out her dad did die in this timeline, but it was like five years ago, so like 2011 or whatever, uh, from an accident, which makes me think it might not be an accident. The whole, like, you know, uh, corrupt cops and everything, maybe they eventually caught up with him because in present day, maybe, you know, going back to what maybe that those memories are affected by the fact is that Raimi from the future was talking to him and that led to him in uh, in that particular timeline possibly getting killed because he started asking so many, so many, maybe he was still asking questions about the whole like corruption thing. I don't know. I know I'm making it super confusing because I'm not making any real sense, but um, it's going to be interesting because I get, I, I'm guessing that's going to be the bit focal point of trying to test stuff, see like what works and what doesn't like, it makes you wonder, like, because what makes it seem like there's only one way this is going to work, like, there's no, like, do-overs. The moment something's been set in stone and changed, like, there's no, like, she's communicating f with him in 96. Her mom went missing in, what, in, like, 97, wasn't it? Wasn't that what they said? I don't remember, like, maybe... Well, no, because it could have been like early 97, because it's like October uh, 96, just like this October-ish uh, 2016. So maybe like, you know, she ended up disappearing like the next couple months or whatever. So, but the thing is like, she's connected to October, like the timeline is parallel to it. I, I keep, I keep forgetting that. So she does have time before her mom goes missing in uh, October of 96, because the timelines, the months they are on the exact day, minute, um, second apart. Like they're acting on the same time frame of every hour. It's synced up every hour, minute, second, or at exact point in time. I know I'm making that super complicated. Just twenty years apart. So you know, I'm, I do apologize because I'm not, I'm not talking clearly. I'm. I feel like I'm, I think I'm getting a little sick and that's kind of messing with my brain a little bit. Sorry. So. Uh, so things, there's time to kind of change things, but it does seem like maybe once you change things, there is no going back. There's no like do over. It's like, oh, the situation didn't work out well. Well, it's too late to go back and change that because it's like, say like someone died in, um, end up finding out someone's dead in uh, 2016. But it's like you try to help that event in 1996, but it doesn't work out because it's like that person ended up dying in 96 and it's like, now it's past the point where Frank can do it can't do anything because she can't talk to him in a past of the past. You know, she can't talk to him in August of 1996. She's stuck talking to him as time is progressing throughout 96. So when it's October uh, 30th, in 2016, it'll be October 30th in 1996. There's no talking to Frank on October 2nd of 96 anymore. So that's going to be a very interesting way Um. um Time travel. I wonder will, how will they go about explaining time travel rules. Like I brought it up before. Every show, every different form of media has their different interpretations of the rules of time travel. Things work this way. They don't work that way. Like I said, because there's no actual physical time travel, how it's more of a communicational aspect. You don't have to worry about things like paradoxes and stuff like that. At least I don't think. I mean, maybe there is a possibility of that. So. I am very interested to see how things will go from here. I'm very invested in this series already, and I can't wait to next week to see where we go. Um, I'm wondering how much of her quote-unquote fiancé is going to play into this story or not. She does have that uh, friend. I forgot his name. 
he's the one that's kind of popped up around her house. Like he was helping Daniel with the whole uh, radio earlier in the episode. She's known him since she was a kid. So maybe that's going to turn into something now that she's not with Daniel. But that's going to be interesting because it's like, well, you have all these memories. You had this relationship with Daniel, but now it's like that doesn't exist anymore. But you still have the memories of it. So, like I said, I can't help but kind of draw conclusions from Flash because, you know, kind of dealt with a similar thing when it's first episode this season. So, I'm wondering, will she try and hook back up with Daniel? You know, maybe when she changes certain events, it's going to be because, you know, if she can save her mom, that means her and Daniel got together because her mom is who introduced her and Daniel. I'm pretty sure like that accident that killed her dad. There's no way that was an accident. It had to be like, oh, yeah, it was um. He was killed, so just, I don't know, like I said, I just have to wait till next week's episode to find out, because I'm really curious to see what they do with this series. But that's really all I want to talk about. To the next time we meet, be happy, be safe, live life to the fullest, and enjoy it. Good day, and goodbye.